in, in its most basic form, paint making has remained the same. It's all about getting an opaque pigment material to be thoroughly moistened with some sort of binder that will hold it to the surface, often vertical surfaces. This is a muller and slab, the muller being the, this grounded stone, and of course the slab. And uh, this particular one is from the 4th century BC. This one is from around 1800. So the, the system of making paint remained very much the same uh, for centuries. Uh, and this setup shows you a uh, red ochre pigment in the foreground. And there, the muller has been used to grind the, the red ochre with pencil uh, oil in order to make the paint. And I'd also point out the brushes in the background, those are the traditional 18th century type of brush, round brush, which holds a good deal of paint. And since these paints were rather highly pigmented, uh, you could get quite a bit of area covered with uh, one charge of the brush. Modern paints, by and large, the basic system has to be the same. However, it has been so mechanized and so perfected that the appearance of modern paints is really not all that similar to handmade paints. Uh, sources from the 18th and early 19th century describe the materials and their uh, limitations and how to deal with them. Uh, unfortunately, over time, naturally, with new techniques, new materials coming on, the old ways were gradually forgotten. This is another excellent source, uh, Pierre Tangri, and you can see the uh, house painters painting the exterior of that uh, uh, townhouse, probably in London, and the fellow in the foreground is graining the door. We'll talk more about graining. Handmade paints, because they are handmade, and also because the pigments were not uh, ground terribly well, um, <laughs> that varies of course, um, would have the, the certain dynamics because of the agglomerations of pigment that would not perfectly blend it throughout the whole paint finish and you'd have areas that were more colorful and less colorful and also sinking in with the, uh, the, the linseed oil would sort of have, there'd be uh, blotches that were matted off because of the imperfect uh, combination of linseed oil and pigment. And in this particular case, you can see that the, there is a clear glaze on the surface, uh, which would give an even gloss level, which was quite important at the time. Uh, you can also see this is a, a Prussian blue and white lead combination, and you can see the different pigment particle sizes of the Prussian blue. Uh, Prussian blue is particularly problematic in its grinding in combination with, with white lead because it continued to disperse in the paint film even as you brushed it. A uh, view of a painter's shop in around 1830 shows an apprentice uh, making paint with a modern slab, the brushes hanging up behind him in different kegs of prepared paints uh, in the background. Because paint making with the mold and slab was a slow process and uh, laborious, there were different ways, early means of attempting to make it not quite so onerous. And this is a cone grinder that was found, this particular one from about uh, 1810. I think this was found in Connecticut. And you would uh, make a slurry of pigment and uh, oil and put it into the hopper and then turn that crank uh, on the top. One of my favorite things about this particular slide is that they evidently never cleaned it. <laughs> you can see all this uh, agglomeration of, of paint on, on the uh, surface of the, of the hopper. What's the hopper made of? Uh, cast iron. Mm -hmm. And one of the other interesting things, particularly now that there's we've come to realize just how serious uh, lead poisoning is. This is a, uh, a French contraption from 1796 because they 
knew that they were dealing with dangerous materials. Uh, the, the little fire that's up here in the, in the uh, uh, pipes here would draw up the fumes and, and dust and so forth away from the uh, paint maker who had this shield, which actually had a glass window that he's looking through. So uh, it's been known for a long time. Of course, not only lead, but things like uh, arsenic and you know, other truly unpleasant materials <coughs> were used. This is a much more common type of, uh, of paint mill. And uh, here you can, you can see it put together. But then when you take off the offer, the thing is you would put the oil and uh, the slurry of oil and pigment that needed to be ground into the hopper and it would uh, then rotate this lower uh, piece that, because of the ridges in it, would conduct the paint to the outside and then that would be scraped off by the, by the knife and you could collect it in, in a uh, pot below. This is a restored uh, finish with used uh, handmade paint for this one. This one is at uh, Hope Lodge. Uh, outside of, of Philadelphia, a uh, good example of a Prussian blue and white lead combination, what it would have looked like when new, quite a bright uh, color. Also applied with the types of brushes that you saw, the round brushes, and the brush marks are retained in the paint, and it was, impo it was important to uh, leave off the brush marks at the end of your application in the direction of the wood, which you can clearly see here, the, the horizontal uh, brush marks and vertical brush marks. And all of this has been uh, varnished with a clear uh, natural resin varnish so that it would be highly reflective. The reason for the reflectivity, of course, is because it's difficult to eliminate these spaces after dark uh, with only candle light. Recently, I've been involved with the restoration of this room, uh, an 18th century room from Massachusetts that is installed in the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. And because we were working in the museum, they would not permit uh, any linseed oil or volatile organic chemicals to be used in the environment of the museum because it would be would dispersed throughout the entire museum. Uh, so this was all done with uh, latex acrylics. We did use the same types of, uh, of brushes, and I added uh, additional titanium dioxide white. Frankly, it was just basic Benjamin Moore paint, uh, eggshell gloss level, to which I added titanium dioxide and then also a bit of blue and a bit of yellow in order to <clears throat> make sure that we had the proper uh, color match and then applied it and we used a uh, Liquitex uh, gloss medium um, conservation varnish on the surface to spin down. And I'm, it's not perfect obviously, but it's, it's I think a very good replication of the type of 18th century finish. It's so it wasn't the paint itself that was glossy, it was the varnishes that were applied over it? The, the paint itself would be glossy when it first went on the linseed oil paint, but over time it loses its gloss level. And it would not be uniformly gloss. So that was the reason historically for the varnish coating to provide a uniform gloss level that would be retained and also protects the paint. Uh, brushing, uh, particularly these combinations of Prussian blue and uh, white lead, uh, was important because in, with Prussian blue it would continue to disperse and paint them. And indeed, uh, Robert Dawson, whose book I showed earlier, recommended using a half-worn brush <laughs> to apply a uh, Prussian blue color because that would continue to blend it out. And here he's talking about uh, Prussian blue, which is the first synthetic pigment that we know of, first discovered in uh, 1704 in Berlin, quite by accident. Uh, what Dossi points out is that 
it's a good pigment if it's relative, you're using quite a bit of it for a dark blue. But of course, most often it's used as a tinting agent in white lead, and not much of it because it was relatively expensive. So it was mostly for reasons sort of mid level, mid tone blues and lighter. Uh, in the 18th century, they knew that in that condition it would turn into a grayish green. And a great number of the gray green colors that were discovered at Colonial Williamsburg in the 1930s were Prussian blues like that blue we saw at, at Hope Lodge in the 18th century that had lost there with the quality of the pigments and also uh, discovered in the Linsular. This is a Prussian blue. Uh, the woodwork was painted with Prussian blue in about 1811 in this house. And you can see that it has uh, faded a great deal, uh, particularly where the, the sun strikes it. The other big problem with historic paint finishes in terms of accurate restoration is the <clears throat> yellowing of the linseed oil binder. And this is a project that I worked on during two different campaigns, a private house in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And the rectangle, that white rectangle that you see there, I had exposed uh, probably about five years before I took this picture. What happened is that uh, this private owner bought this very beautiful house and hired an architect and a whole bunch of people like me and an archaeologist and so forth. I think he ran out of money.